Uh, I've been asked to speak on focal prostate cryosurgery. And the presentation discusses new and evolving topics for which the level of evidence still remains moderately low. So um, the focal therapy rationale has been discussed at this meeting. Uh, the incidence of unifocal cancer in prostatectomy specimens uh, ranges from 13 to 38 percent as reported. Uh, essentially, we're treating the index uh, lesion uh, with a variety of techniques and margins, and we survey the remainder. This is the cornerstone of focal therapy. And the first focal techniques were first trialed in the late 1990s, particularly Dr. Guy de, de Ovencien in uh, Haifu and Gary Onik for cryo. The current state of patient selection for focal, as discussed a few days ago, an organ sparing approach might be appropriate for those discontinuing active surveillance for a solitary focus of grade group 2 cancer as an alternative to whole gland treatment. The ideal patient has 10 years life expectancy. Uh, single or multiple multi MPMRI visible biopsy proven intermediate risk tumors. Um, we can treat and avoid nerves, urethra, and sphincter. And uh, most suitable candidates nowadays are intermediate risk. Uh, some will be localized higher volume, low risk. And if you have targetable higher risk lesions, probably best to do this uh, within a clinical trial. There is still an unknown as to the limit of the volume of grade group one disease that can be left untreated. Well, there's certainly been a, a um, blossoming interest in focal therapy over the years. This is based on publications, uh, PubMed search over the last uh, 20 years. And you can see the curve is still going up. In terms of focal cryoblation, the ice ball forms via extraction of heat. We do typically two freeze thaw cycles. We induce cell rupture and cell death. Uh, it has a variety of um, mechanisms of action, but predominantly it's uh, freezing and disruptive. It's different from radiation and chemo because it's not cell cycle dependent, and for that reason, oftentimes we use this in the salvage setting. The mechanisms of death, uh, cell membrane rupture, biochemical changes, ischemia, apoptosis, is done transperineally. It is associated with an immune response, as is many of these uh, uh, focal treatments. Uh, but one of the benefits of focal cryoablation is it's excellent uh, to, op to monitor this intraoperatively because the edge of the ice ball is hyperechoic. I'll leave this for you to look at at a later time, but basically this is our um, expert uh, uh, consensus. We've had a number of panels since 2010 all the way through 2021 looking at the goal of focal, uh, risk groups, diagnostic approaches, and disease factors. This has evolved over time and will continue to evolve. But in a nutshell, the goals of image-targeted focal cryoblation are threefold. First, to eradicate imageable or biopsy-proven clinically significant cancer. Uh, as mentioned the other day, we could do this also without an image-guided uh, treatment pattern. We can base this on the transperineal mapping biopsy, uh, as was discussed the other day. Um, we avoid the urinary and sexual dysfunction toxicity that's associated typically with whole gland or radical treatments, and we want a fast, simple outpatient procedure. And my personal opinion is that cryoablation fits all these um, traits. These are some of the applications of uh, focal therapy. I call your attention to the top left one. We do have some users now that are doing targeted ablation in the clinic setting with uh, minimal anesthesia basically just local blocks and sedation. Uh, I think this is where we all want to be at some point. Um, you know, if you're going to only put a single probe in uh, with the patient a little bit groggy, it's, it's going to be uh, more challenging. Hemiablation in the bottom left has been really the workhorse over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, some thought that this would go away, but it, there's still lots of publications coming out. I think most of us now are going to the quadrant ablation which means we're targeting the clinically significant tumor with a much broader margin uh, in the order of a centimeter. And then the hockey stick is the one described uh, where you can treat the contralateral anterior zone and perhaps not risk uh, sexual dysfunction because you're leaving that nerve intact. So this is just an example of a uh, RO, uh, ROI. This is a grade group two cancer. The volume is 1.2 cc's. There was no ECE 
the volume is 33, and you can easily put a probe or several probes into that area. I do mine in the operating room, so as, as uh, Samir mentioned, uh, I like the triangulation of, um, effect because you're basically overlapping the lethal zones of the ice. I think you get better kill, and in an outpatient operative setting, to me, that's an ideal way to do it. Of course, if you're doing this in a clinic with a um, sedate, sedate patient, you may be putting fewer probes in and perhaps risking under treatment. Um, the triangulation of lethal ice with overlapping ice balls is important. Some of the uh, products that are made commercially allow you to adjust the length of the ice ball, some not. You have to do, um, choose different uh, lengths of ice based on the manufacturer that you're using. Uh, but typically, we tend to treat the length of the prostate in most cases, but you know, for many of these tumors, if you can localize them along the length, the sagittal plane, you can, you can shorten your treatment zone and just put your ice on your tumor. So what does focal cryoablation offer? It's a direct, minimally invasive uh, approach uh, via the perineum. It's outpatient. The freeze time is typically in the order of 45 minutes for two freeze-thaw cycles, and that tends to be very consistent. Uh, anesthesia time may, may add another 45 minutes or so, depending. Um, it's definitely customizable and it's controllable. It's image-guided ablation. Again, you can use it without uh, imaging. You can do uh, zonal ablation as well based on pathological mapping. So there's a lot of benefits to, to doing this. Uh, you can monitor this quite readily with real-time ultrasound. Uh, typically, we keep a Foley catheter in for a short term because there is swelling associated with treatment. And uh, what I'll show you with the results, it definitely does preserve erectile and urinary function, maintaining quality of life. So this is a schematic of that same tumor that I showed you a few slides back, now outlined in red, showing that what you can do is you can, you can place your Doppler probe on that, that nerve bundle in question, and during your freezing, you can monitor the flow and also put thermal sensors there to make sure that, um, that you're not getting too much cold energy on the nerve bundle, if, if that's your intention. So we monitor in two ways. Uh, the monitoring is easy, it's very reliable, and it's familiar to those doing cryotherapy. Uh, uh, this is a picture of the ice ball. It's, it's uh, anechoic uh, beyond the ice edge because the uh, sound bounces off the ice edge, which you see right here is being very hyperechoic, and then you have the rectal surface just below it. Um, many of these products come with several temperature probes, thermocouples that you can place wherever you want. Most people will place one into the, um, the uh, sphincter to monitor th sphincter temperatures and any other in Denavier's. So how does cryo work? First, you form extracellular ice. Uh, those crystals begin to enlarge. There's um, uh, shifts of solutes from in to outside the cell. And there's many things happening at the, at the same time. Now, let's, let's talk about the isotherm because this is important. Um, some of these products, you can measure the inside uh, of the ice, and typically it's around minus 80 degrees centigrade. Uh, this is the, what we call the necrotic zone. Uh, cells in general can't live in this inner core of very cold ice, but as you get a little further towards the periphery, it's what we call the apoptotic zone, and it could it occur to temperatures as cold as minus 15 to minus 20. Some of those cells will repopulate, some will die. The ice edge, of course, is zero degrees. These are just some of the mechanisms that are happening all at the same time. Metabolic uncoupling, energy deprivation, free radicals, ionic imbalance, pH thifts, particularly acidosis, membrane phase transitions, cytoskeletal disassembly, um, extracellular followed by intracellular ice, hyperosmolarity, cell volume disruption, denatured proteins, sharing of the membrane, vascular stasis, followed by an immune response. So many things happening during cryoablation. In the end, you can see here on the left, this is a, a histological photo of prostate cancer, and what we aim for is, is just uh, post-cryoablation coagulative necrosis. So really, to me, um, the improvements that'll come with any kind of device therapy is in the margin. 
as was mentioned earlier, uh, you have to overlap your energy sufficiently to kill those cells. Um, but with any device, uh, whether it's HIFU or cryo or, or um, you know, photodynamic therapy, it's trying to get lethal temperatures or kill uh, within the margins of your um, treatment zone. So we looked at vitamin D as a uh, sensitizer for cryoablation. Initially, John Baus lab did this in, in uh, cell culture. Uh, we found out that vitamin D3 was a uh, sensitizer to cryo cryoablation. We followed that up with uh, the murine prostate cancer model in my lab at Duke, and we uh, wrote several papers on this. We then determined that the mechanism of action for cryosensitization was mediated via mitochondrial uh, mediated apoptosis. Just wanted to share a few um, pictures from that paper that demonstrate what this means. So what we see here with these individual bars is time of treatment. So on the left is pre-freeze and on the right is day nine. And so with the control, nothing basically happens. These are Ellen cap models with freezing at minus 15, which is sublethal temperatures. Then we add a little bit of vitamin D. You see a little bit more uh, cell death or less viability. When we do a freeze alone, again, it knocks it down, but this is minus 15, so it's sublethal. And then over time, a lot of those cells can repopulate because they're not sufficiently killed. But when we add vitamin D, as you see here, it, it does a much better effect at killing those cancers. This is the same uh, bar graph looking at androgen-independent disease. These are more hardy tumors, so they withstand uh, cold better. Uh, so as you can see, when you try to freeze to minus 15, which is sublethal temperatures, they really don't uh, budge as much as the androgen-insensitive population. But again, when you add the vitamin D, the uh, killing is much more effective. And this is what it looks like. Um, on the plots, so the green is, is alive and the red is dead. This is a single uh, passage of uh, LN cap cells, single freeze. You could see at about minus 15, they, they typically start to die. But when you add vitamin D, uh, the, the killing is much more effective. This is the antigen insensitive um, cell line. Again, it takes colder temperatures, about minus 30 or so, to start killing these cells. But when you add vitamin D, uh, much more of this area is red, which means that they're dead. And finally, this is what we typically do in practice. This is androgen-sensitive cells with a double freeze-thaw cycle. So minus 15 tends to kill the majority of those cells, uh, but when you add vitamin D, the killing is much more effective. Um, it's important to talk the same language uh, when looking at outcomes. Um, so we had two um, consensus panels that addressed this topic on both functional and oncological outcomes. Overall, we felt it was reasonable to retreat patients with focal in 20% of cases, as is typically done with um, small renal tumors when, when using ablation. For the definitions of functional outcomes for continence, we use a very strict definition of no pad use, and it's approaching 100% for image-guided ablation. I would state that it doesn't really matter what the energy is. A lot of the different energies are achieving these numbers. The potency uh, definitions will vary. If you do true targeted away from the nerves, it may be greater than 95%, but it really depends where those lesions are in relationship to the nerve bundles. So I wanted to walk you through some of the latest um, outcomes on cryotherapy. Um, this is Duke Bond series, 2012, Shaw, 2019, Oishi, 2019. Small numbers of patients, 73 to 169. Uh, this is the inclusion criteria. Uh, most of these are, in terms of follow-up, the median is three years. Most of these are treated in hemigland fashion. These are the risk groups, intermediate two-thirds, intermediate 71%, and high-risk two-thirds in this uh, study. But when you look at metastasis-free survival in the short term, it's always quite good. We don't expect many of these tumors to metastasize. It's just like the actual surveillance approaching 100%. Cancer-specific survival, again, approaching 100%. The continence is excellent, 97 to 100%. And the erectile function, again, varies with the potency coming in and how much tissue in relation to the nerve bundles ablated. The oncological outcomes, positive biopsy in the treated area, 25% in this study. Overall, failure-free survival, 90%. 
in this study, and failure-free survival overall 85% in the OESHI uh, study. These are some additional studies coming out most recently, 2021. Uh, let's start with the cold study, uh, 166, so still small numbers. The follow-up, uh, very short for most of the uh, people. Biochemical-free survival at five years, 70%. Uh, treatment failure-free survival, 85%. Treatment failure-free survival, 62, and 75% at five years. So these numbers are pretty consistent throughout studies. The continence is, is consistent 95 to 100%, and again, the potency varies between 40 and 80%. This is data from our uh, institution. We use customized partial gland ablation. Uh, the first two graphs look at failure-free survival. Overall, we had 75%, and it really didn't make a difference whether it was focal, hemi, or subtotal, I think largely because we're treating the index area. And as uh, Dr. Tanasia uh, also mentioned, cryo seems to be a very broad brushstroke of treatment as opposed to the laser. This is what the uh, International Index of Erectile Function looks like. Uh, uh, most men that, that we treat come in with not perfect erections. They're in their 15 to 18 category. Um, this is treated with true focal. Uh, they do the best in terms of regaining function. This is the hemiablation which does the second best, and then when you start doing subtotal, the uh, potency starts to tailor off a bit. This is the AUA symptom score, so no matter what you're doing in terms of treatment uh, 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 template, uh, it improves, and I think this is also a good way to improve function because we're also treating some of the BPH. We don't have a lot of long-term outcomes. There's one study I'd like to call your attention to. This is a study by uh, Mara et al. in 2021. Uh, comparing match peer analysis between focal uh, cryo and active surveillance. They found that the, um, the focal cryo increased the time to radical or systemic treatment but did not have the advantage for metastasis-free uh, survival or overall survival. Wanted to end with a few other concepts. This is anterior gland freeze. With MRI, we're seeing more of these anterior tumors. We can effectively ablate them in a small series. You see that the IPSS essentially did not change pre and post, five and four, and also the, in, the international erectile function did not change pre and post when ablating the anterior gland, 19.5 and 19. This is what it looks like. We have uh, four probes treating the entire anterior gland here. You can see the ice ball hyperchoic rim coming down halfway, and this is the temperature and, um, and uh, freeze um, schema. How to surveil post-op expert consensus, two reports in the literature. Uh, we've touched on in-field uh, failure, which is your intended target, and out-of-field uh, failure. We have to call a spade a spade and, and put these in two separate categories because this is basically what we're being judged on, and this may be, reflect patient selection failure. Uh, again, we had two, two consensus reports uh, on this uh, particular topic. Um, and in terms of functional outcomes, there's a lot of uh, validated questionnaires. We're very strict with no pads for ur urinary control, but we could not reach a consensus for sexual function definitions. So in terms of the future of focal cryo, in terms of uh, surgeon's preference, it'll probably be going to office based. There's some technologies that I don't think can go to office based, like IRE. You need paralysis for that. Uh, we will have portable devices for treatment and monitoring and much of this will become robotic in the future. Patient expectations, you have to assess their values and goals. There's the ideal patient uh, uh, for focal, and really follow-up is important. One of the biggest challenges we see is they don't want to come back because they feel otherwise well. Um, this is what minimally invasive cryosurgery offers. I, I feel that it can meet all of these um, bullet points here. And finally, I want to conclude with, we've launched the Focal Therapy Society in 2019. Um, we've launched an international outcomes registry that you can put your data in, any device, any treatment scheme, and uh, we've partnered with the Endourological Society, so please uh, come and join us. Thank you very much for your attention.